there's definitely a shiny object syndrome across the board here where there's just so much coming at consumers that either they're paralyzed and they're saying, all right, I'm going to wait for the dust to settle mm -hmm. in 2030 and then figure out our AI strategy then, or they're trying the latest things and they're modifying their code base very regularly, obviously creating a lot of overhead and technical debt as a result. How do you think about dealing with the progression in the space and still maintaining that incremental and more level-headed approach to building out some of these features so that they're actually performing well? The way that I've tried to address with, the, with my library with Instructor is the fact that I want to write code that is very easy to delete. And not only is it easy to delete, there's not very many levels of abstraction. Like if you take a function that uses Instructor and you go to VS Code and you command click any function, you'll go immediately to the standard library. All we do is we give you a couple of keyword arguments into the OpenAI SDK. And so when you want to change something, when you want to delete something, there's not much you have to keep in your head. All you have to focus on is what is the function and what is the type of the response object you're going to get. And once you get back there, it's just regular code. And by having a light framework and by having something that's easy to delete, it's very easy to do experimentation because everything fits in your head. When something needs to change, you know what needs to change. I think some of these frameworks really have gone a little bit too complicated. And so when something new comes out, not only is it hard to delete, to add a new feature, you had to touch so much of that code base that, uh, again, you end up iterating much slower. Yeah, I was just thinking about these frameworks when you are mentioning that, because I, I see that agility as being a competitive advantage in this industry. As a company, it's important to steer away from anything that's going to introduce more dependencies that may backfire later on. And so when you think about these frameworks, obviously a lot of them have seen tremendous success. They've simplified a lot of parts of the development process. But how would you encourage companies or how do you encourage companies that you're consulting to think about these frameworks when they're building AI-powered features? I would say a lot of it is just pick the tools that have great documentation. Things are moving so quickly. There's a part of me that understands when something new comes out, you want to break the code for that and, and, and show that this exists. But on the other hand, for a company, you have to pick code that is like somewhat reliable and somewhat stable. And having document that's update means that they actually have the bandwidth to maintain things that they've built rather than always chasing after that, that shiny object. The other thing too is when you see code that does a lot of work for you up front, what you're doing is you're borrowing time in the future. If you're able to do something that takes 400 lines of code in 20 minutes with six lines of code, what this really means is six months from now, when you want to change that code, one line of code has to impact a large network of internal complexity. And what we found is with, with a lot of our clients, we end up going off of these frameworks primarily because we need to make three or four changes that are very important to the business because they capture some kind of business logic that doesn't fit the model of any of these frameworks. For the most part, I've seen a lot of folks just roll their own infrastructure. And a lot of the time, you're only really replacing like maybe a thousand lines of code. Instead of taking out one day, taking a week to build something out might mean six months in the future, things are a lot more manageable.